This is a wonderful idea to bring uh, students together. Forensic science is really a very old field of practice. As a matter of fact, I love to mention this uh, when I'm talking with physicians that I can make a strong, cogent, uh, quite logical argument for the fact that forensic pathology, my field especially, is the oldest medical specialty in the world. Just think, thousands of years ago, nobody was doing coronary artery bypass graft surgery, nobody was taking out uh, the livers, nobody was doing colectomies for cancer, uh, pneumonectomies and brain surgery, but what they were doing in every civilized community that has ever existed on the face of this earth is trying to find out why someone died. Suddenly, inexplicably, <clears throat> unexpectedly, uh, apparently maybe from foul play or injuries of some kind. It may have been for religious or superstitious reasons, um, and things varied uh, from one society to another. Greek, Roman, Persian, uh, Israeli, Chinese, they weren't always the same. But whatever their motivations, whatever their reasons were, they wanted to know when someone was found dead with his head smashed in, uh, they wanted to know how did it happen, if for no other reason than, my God, might this happen to me tomorrow? In some places, they actually had systems of justice uh, to bring people um, to a court to pay uh, for their crimes. So who were the people that made these determinations? Obviously, they were uh, quite uh, crude by our standards today, uh, with limited knowledge of human anatomy, physiology, pathology, etc. We understand that. But that's not the point, that to whatever extent they did undertake such endeavors, and to whatever degree they were able to make valid determinations, the idea that this was done, think about it, it had to be done. Anytime you had people living together in a civilized community, it had to be done. And that was the birth of forensic science, whether it was in the field of medicine, law enforcement, forensic science, uh, uh, criminalist type people, it was done. We see references then through the ages when Julius Caesar was stabbed by 23 of his fellow senators, a determination was made by the great Roman physician Antistius that only one of the 23 wounds could have been fatal. How he made that determination, we can't know, and how correct it was um, leaves it open to question, but to think that that kind of investigation was even contemplated and undertaken, that is truly fascinating. And you got the Hammer Code of Hammurabi, and then through the centuries, um, the Carolinian Code, and it moves on, references in all the great religious tractates, the Talmud and others. In the 13th century, the Chinese put together a magnificent book uh, translated into English, The Washing of Wrongs, in which essentially they instructed people who would be uh, forensic science uh, investigators, homicide detectives, what do you do when you go to the scene? Uh, what do you note? What do you want to determine? How long is the body lying there? Is this the place where the crime was committed, where the death occurred, or was the body brought there? These are the determinations that had to be made. And a lot of those observations that they made are valid today. In 1965, we did our first International Medical Legal Seminar at the University of Rome with the Institute of Legal Medicine there. And I had the great pleasure of actually holding and reading uh, the magnificent book written by the famous uh, physician to the Pope, Zakia, in the latter part of the 16th century. He wrote this Medicina Questiones Legal, in which he set forth all kinds of questions that he addressed. And again, a lot of these are questions and matters that we deal with today. Was the baby born alive or was the baby killed? Um, how do you determine whether somebody <clears throat> was uh, dead at that spot, uh, how they died, um, and so on? Rape and sexual assault, how did you make those determinations? Um, all kinds of things. These haven't changed. The basic issues, crime, uh, whether it's murder, rape, sexual assault, um, whether it's infanticide. So the basic structure has always been there. The medical legal system that we have in this country, which is a kind of a um, hybrid 
you have a medical examiner system and you have a coroner system. And the origins of that, <clears throat> of those two systems, um, are, are interesting and something that you should uh, be aware of as you think about forensic science just as a matter of history. In the um, 12th uh, into the 13th century, the King of England wanted to make sure that when properties became available, that he would get his share. Personal property, it could be chattels, it could be a <clears throat> cargo coming on a ship uh, that went uh, onto the shoals. It could have been a carriage uh, with six magnificent steeds uh, that uh, had run over somebody, whatever. And in those days, it wasn't like Great Britain is today with one solid uh, queen king there were earls and dukes and barons and individuals all over, and they were seizing whatever became available. If there was a conflict between uh, two such people and one was vanquished, then you might have thousands of serfs and tens of thousands of acres of property. Who was going to get that? So the king said, I need my people to be there and get my share. And he got royal knights of the realm, and he appointed them. And because they were appointed by the king, by the crown, they were called crowners. What is the Latin word for crown? Corona, hence the beginning of the coroner system in the 12th century. Then transposed, of course, transferred into the colonies and adopted here. That is the origin of the coroner system. And it existed in this country um, completely until 1877. In 1877, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts adopted the first medical examiner system. And there was a scandal there involving the passage of um, <clears throat> the transferring of uh, bodies, usually little infants that could be carried in paper bags from one coroner to another, each one getting a fee and so on. And that scandal led to the adoption of a medical examiner system. The medical examiner system was based upon the medical legal approach that developed in Europe following the Dark Ages, the Renaissance. Great universities were established in all the major cities, law schools, medical schools, and quite soon, as of course will always be the case, law and medicine must interface. You can't have one without the other. You can't have medicine with medical questions unless you are able to deal with them legally, and you can't deal with matters legally unless you have medical input. And that kind of interface between law and medicine is then what gave, ro gave rise to um, what became medical legal forensic scientific practices. As a matter of fact, some of the early physicians, including Benjamin Rush, George Washington's doctor, went over to England and Scotland to take that very kind of training at the beginning of the 19th century. So that was the, the basis, the origin of what came to be known in this country as the medical examiner system. The next change occurred in 1917 in New York City, and at the present time, uh, I would say it's like about 50-50. The large metropolitan uh, communities, uh, for the most part, have a medical examiner system. It's an appointed system, and the um, rural, semi-rural areas uh, have a corner system. In some states, like California and um, others, uh, they'll have a combination. Um, in California, they even have a connection between a sheriff and a coroner in some of their smaller counties where the sheriff is also the coroner and, and that's mixed together. I'm not here to talk about the relative merits or problems of each of the systems, uh, but I will say this, that it does not matter as far as I am concerned what the name of the system is or whether the coroner is elected or the medical examiner is appointed. What matters and what counts and what plays out is whether the individual running the office understands what is involved with medical legal investigation, official governmental medical legal investigation, the determination of violent, sudden, suspicious, unexpected, unexplained, medically unattended deaths, to determine uh, the time of death, the place of death, to make rulings that play out across the board civilly and criminally. And this gets into the determination of manner of death. That's the bigger problem for us in forensic pathology. Cause of death 
There are cases that are perplexing, of course, I'm not suggesting that it's always a piece of cake, but if I have a guy with a gunshot wound in his head, I'll do the autopsy. That's not gonna be a problem for me. A freshman medical student could tell me that, and maybe a freshman high school student could tell me that. The question is, was it a homicide, was it a suicide, or was it accidentally inflicted? There are five manners of death in decreasing order of occurrence, natural accident, suicide, homicide, and sometimes undetermined. Sometimes you just can't be sure. As a matter of fact, I should have thrown in undetermined on my <clears throat> gunshot wound of the head case because maybe you just can't be sure. And uh, that's important for us in forensic science and it's important for law enforcement officers too to recognize and keep in mind that sometimes, sometimes there are cases that cannot be determined. And that is very, very important. And as far as I'm concerned, it's a key issue uh, for good homicide detectives and district attorneys to keep in mind as it is for forensic pathologists. You don't always have to come up with an answer. You're not always able to come up with an answer. And sometimes um, you can't be sure. So you do the proper investigation. You undertake everything to the fullest extent possible. So that's the background and the origin. 